So welcome. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Amanda Long. I'm the Fine Arts Coordinator at Stevenson, and I'm happy to be here hosting our art talk today. Of course, you know uh, Miss Connolly, and this is our guest today, Leah Dunbach. And um, I'm going to read just a little bit from her bio um, to introduce her. Actually, in just a moment, I do want to share with you, students, um, if you have questions, um, please be brave <laughs> and put them into the chat. Um, Leah is a, a student to answering our questions here today. You can put those questions in the chat or in the Q&A and I'll be watching for them. Um, if it's you know, a good moment, I'll jump in and ask Leah then. Otherwise, we may save some questions to the end. Um, we are out today at 1.41. So sometime around 1.30 or a little bit after, uh, we'll transition into, into some questions. So um, I'm really excited to have Leah with us today. This is going to be fun. Um, she is a 20-year-old photographer, photography student at Sheridan College in Oakville, Ontario. Uh, this fall, she began her third year of a four-year Bachelor of Photography program, and she's been um, working since early, uh, since the age of 13. She's been mentored by Joel Sartor, who's a National Geographic photographer and fellow. Uh, for the past five years, Leah has been traveling to cities throughout the world, um, such as Toronto, New York, Washington, D.C., and Brisbane, uh, photographing the unhoused populations there and recording their stories. Uh, in, at the end of 2019, so fairly recently, her third book, titled Nowhere to Call Home, Photo Photographs and Stories of the Homeless, Volume 3, was released. Uh, and in the summer of 2017, The National aired a documentary about her photography work and stories um, of people experiencing homelessness. Um, since then, Leah has attracted worldwide attention and um, had media and newspaper articles and television stories and all sorts of wonderful things happening um, in the United States, the Netherlands, um, Canada, and beyond. So um, we've got a worldwide profile here uh, for you to share with us, Leah. That's really cool and exciting. Um, our students, this is a photography class. Yes, Maureen. And um, so we've got students that are really ready to hear about your work. So um, you can share your screen. Um, feel free to ask any questions if I can help you with anything, but you can take it away. Great, thank you. My mom and I used to take me around. Larry, who is a Mohawk Indian, told my dad and I as I took his photograph across the road from the Hamilton Salvation Army in, in Ontario. She died now, and ever since she died, I've been on my own. As Larry said this, he broke down into tears. Sorry, he said. My mom used to keep me under her wing. When I first came to the city, I was uh, working as a bricklayer, but I got hurt. I haven't been able to work in a year and a half now. I ended up here. Mom used to bring me here and I'd go, I've got food, I don't need to come here. But she'd say, someday son, you might not. I want you to be safe when I'm gone. So she showed me this place, showed me all the places I could get something to eat. And I've never been so desperate since she's been gone in my entire life. I raised my five kids and I don't know what happened. I just ended up here and they grew up through a veil of tears. Larry went on to tell us when he was just eight years old, his father died. My mother couldn't handle us. So children's aid came to take us. I remember looking out the back window crying, watching her get smaller and smaller. Her dying words were, Larry, I'm sorry I didn't teach you what the world was about. I was kidnapped for six years. Trina, 
not her real name, told my dad and I as I took her photograph in Toronto. It was on the news, she exclaimed. Yeah, I've been assaulted and beaten on the streets a million times. The cops don't care. The cops just stand there and laugh. A lot of poor people get beaten all the time. And the cops will just laugh at us. At this, Trina started to cry. Sorry, she said. It's a really touchy subject. I was assaulted by cops when I was 15 years old, she said. If you don't have drugs, they beat you and take your money, she said. Down here, they think you're no good or nothing, she continued. I didn't have parents. I had to raise myself, she exclaimed. My parents were drug dealers. A lady took me in and tried to get me to go to school, but it was too late for me. After being assaulted, beaten and tortured, given drugs. It was no fun, she said. I didn't have a choice. Good morning. My name is Leah Denbach, and for the past several years now, I think six specifically, I have been photographing people experiencing homelessness and recording their stories. More precisely, with my book series, Nowhere to Call Home, and my exhibitions, I am trying to focus on the two goals. Firstly, to humanize people experiencing homelessness, but secondly, to shine a spotlight on the problem of homelessness. However, if there's one message that I really wanna drive across in my presentation, it is this. If you don't know them, don't judge them. After all, is it wise for us to draw a conclusion about someone without first knowing the facts? Of course not, but this is precisely what we do with people experiencing homelessness. We don't know the facts about them. We don't know their stories, yet we judge them. We think that they are lazy, that they chose to be on the street. But who are we to judge these people? And how can we think that they are lazy or that they have chosen to be on the street, especially people like Larry and Trina? after hearing their stories. I think it is important for us to see that judging people experiencing homelessness only serves to take, stigmatize a group that has already been marginalized. I believe that people experiencing homelessness need not our judgment, but our compassion. People like Larry and Trina, especially, at this time, I'm gonna to show to you a five minute music video that I think powerfully destroys these myths about people experiencing homelessness, that they are lazy or that they chose to be on the street. The video was called, Who Cares? And it contains 70 of my photographs. The video is set to music to the song, Who Cares? Which is by Fred Foster Jr. of Germany. It is written by Mary Applegate, who wrote The Power of Love, one of Celine Dion's biggest hits. So I'll bring that video up for you all. Just give me one second. Not a bad dream. 
Throughout the rest of my presentation, you will notice that I'm frequently making mention of my father, Tim. And that is because my project has really been a partnership between the two of us. My father accompanies me on virtually all of my photo shoots with people experiencing homelessness. He interviews the individuals while I take their photograph. He then helps me choose the images for my books nowhere to go home, and as well as he helps me write the stories for the books because writing is really not my strong suit. But my mother has also been a big influence, been upon me beginning to photograph people experiencing homelessness. At the age of three, 
She was found wandering the crowded streets of Calcutta, India by a police officer. She had several deep cuts to the head and was probably bleeding at the time. Since the police officer knew that Mother Teresa never turned away any children, she was brought to Mother Teresa's orphanage where she was raised until the age of five when she was adopted to Canada. Needless to say, if it wasn't for the story of my mother and the cognizant support of both my parents, I wouldn't be doing this project or in front of you today. Over the past several years, I have photographed hundreds of people experiencing homelessness, and I've really come to see firsthand how our harmful judgments can really be negative towards people experiencing homelessness. Just to give you one example, I was photographing this individual named Stephen outside of a bank in Collingwood, Ontario. When one of the bank's managers stormed towards us, barking, as Stephen put it, like a chihuahua. Evidently, someone had told her that someone had opened alcohol in front of the bank and she wrongfully accused Stephen. Stephen also told us recently when he was panhandling outside of the bank, someone walked up to him and said, well, you look well fed. Despite being very offended at the gall of the person, Stephen said he bit his tongue. However, indignant as he recounted the incident, Stephen said, I wanted to say, you son of a blank, I could have been 400 pounds yesterday. You don't know. Sadly, we learned that shortly after the photograph was taken, Stephen was beaten up and killed on the streets. When my dad and I came across Becky, she was in a very bad way. Becky was sprawled out on the sidewalk less than a couple of meters from the very busy road in Toronto. Since we were very concerned about her safety, we had no qualms about walking up to wake her up and see if she would like to have her photograph taken. She agreed to have her photograph taken. However, most of her responses were of a yes or a no variety. She did say, however, that she grew up in Peterborough, Ontario, and that she moved to Toronto and has lived here for 40 years. She said that she does not stay in the shelters, except when it gets cold, and that she doesn't have any family. When it was time to say goodbye, I said, it was nice to meet you. And she said, it was really nice to meet you too. When I posted Becky's photograph and story on my Humanizing the Homeless Instagram account, I received several comments from Becky's friends and family who had been trying to get in contact with her. One woman, Amanda said, thank you so much for being so nice to Becky. Becky is my birth mother and I've been trying to find her. Another woman, Barb, commented, Becky was a childhood friend and a wonderful person. This is what happens when mental illness and life beats you down over decades. And another woman, Jennifer, thank you for sharing. Becky is the sister of my longtime friend of 30 years, Jean. Incredible, we never knew what happened to her. And lastly, Nikki, I am a friend of Dave, the brother of Becky. We have been trying to get in touch with her. And if you are wondering if you are, have you, if you have any information regarding her contact, if you could please, 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 please let us know. Sadly, we learned that shortly after the photograph was taken, Becky was struck and killed by a car. And I ask you again, who are we to judge these people? But I would now like to give you an update on one of my earlier photographs and stories 
You may be familiar with Lucy's photograph because she's on the cover of my first book. I was standing at the corner of Young and Dundas Street in Toronto, in front of the Eaton Centre, Canada's busiest mall. As I stood there, we noticed Lucy standing about 25 meters away as she was retrieving something out of a bag. Lucy was a very lonely and forlorn figure. She was also dressed in very old, dirty clothes. When my dad and I walked up to introduce ourselves, my dad said, hello, my name is Tim and this is my daughter, Leah. We are working on a project called Nowhere to Call Home, Photographs and Stories of the Homeless. Would you like to be a part of it? Explaining in a bit more detail. When Lucy said yes, but could you take my boyfriend Riley's photo too? And we, were, we said, yes, of course. So Lucy ran north along Young Street and returned about 10 minutes later with Riley in tow. Lucy and Riley seated themselves on the north wall of the Eaton Center. It has a massive lit up white wall, which serves as a perfect backdrop. As I began to ask some questions, Lucy began to tell us, I once had big dreams. I've always been a writer, like journaling and short stories and whatnot. She told my dad and I, but now it's hard to keep up with the stuff that you love anymore because it's just survival. Lucy is an opioid addict. I've been an opioid addict since I was 14, she said, but it's always been manageable. I had a job, I had interests, I had a place to live. However, one day, Lucy's opioid addiction took over her life. She found herself with no job, no schooling, no place to call home. Lucy also told us that she's had a really hard time sleeping outside. Not surprisingly, her eyes were closing repeatedly as I was trying to interview her. She said, a lot of people like can, you know, adjust, but I haven't been able to. Lucy did tell us excitedly I'm soon gonna be moving to transitional housing in like three days. So I'll get my own bedroom and I'll share a kitchen with my own bathroom. Sadly, this was not the case. For the following fall, when I was doing a photo shoot outside of the Eden Center once again, we saw Lucy and Riley sleeping on a broken cardboard box in the middle of the sidewalk. At one point, Lucy woke up and lifted her head. My dad and I were immediately very shocked by her appearance. She looked in very poor health. How was she ever gonna make it through the winter? My dad said to me. And then as the seasons began to change and my book had finally come out with Lucy's face on the cover, we wanted to find Lucy to give her the good news and a copy of the book. However, first we had to locate her. We spent months looking for Lucy outside of the Eden Center with no luck. And a question kept creeping into our minds. Was Lucy able to make it through the winter? But then in the summer of 2018, much to our relief, we came across Lucy and Riley once again, squeezing car windows at the corner of Young and Dundas. We were able to give Lucy a copy of the book and she was ob absolutely jubilant. She was jumping up and down yelling, woohoo. It was very rewarding for me to be able to bring this little bit of happiness to a young woman's life who had seen so much misery. Several months later, as the seasons began to change to summer once again, I was outside of the Eaton Center and we came across Lucy and we were pleasantly surprised to see that she was well dressed this time. She told us that she had managed to get off the street and that she was staying at a women's shelter and that Riley too had somewhere to stay. She also told us that she had managed to get her drug problem under control. 
When it was time to say goodbye to Lucy, she said something to me that really stood out. She said, this is a really good thing that you two are doing. Then in the winter of 2018, a producer with a me major media outlet expressed interest in doing a story about how the cover image of Lucy on the book had a positive effect upon Lucy's life. However, first we had to locate Lucy. We spent months looking for Lucy once again. And we kept wondering, where was Lucy? Then we came across Riley. However, this time he was alone. We could immediately tell from the expression on his face that something was very wrong. Lucy is in the hospital, he said, as he began to broke down, break down into tears. She's not doing well, he said. When it was time to say goodbye, Riley said to me something that, that I will never forget. He said, when you put Lucy on the cover of your book, it made her feel human. Then a few months later, as we began to f look for Lucy, to ask her permission about the media, we began to wonder, did Lucy make it through what she was struggling through at the hospital? And we began to worry about her since we did several photo shoots outside of the Eaton Center in Toronto once again, she was nowhere to be found. A, crush, a question kept creeping into our minds. Was she still alive? Then after a futile search, we came across one of Lucy's friends outside of a safe injection center in Toronto who said she would happily pass on the information. The very next day, we had a, a message on the answering machine from Lucy and when we called her back, she told us that her and Riley were now housed and even sharing an apartment together and that they were doing much better. When we told Lucy about the positive news story, she was so excited and couldn't wait to be a part of it. She also told us that she had managed to get her drug problem under control and that she had even began writing again. Later that day, we received an email from Riley and it said something that I will never forget and something that has always stood out to me. He said, I can't begin to thank you enough, partly because your book exists and the fact that you chose to put Lucy on the cover of your book is the reason that we are alive today. When you took Lucy's photograph, we had given up on life but now we have chosen to live. We no longer smoke crack cocaine, which was very difficult to say the least. Lucy is now a healthy weight and happier than I've seen her in a long time. And I know that I am. We are now on our, well, on our way to being healthy in both mind, body, and soul. Albert Schweitzer, a theologian, physician, and humanitarian once said, I have always held firmly to the thought that each one of us can bring some portion of misery to an end. And I agree wholeheartedly. Let me suggest to you three things that we can all do to help people experience homelessness in our own life. Firstly, we can treat people experiencing homelessness with respect. To quote Mother Teresa, we have the wrong idea that the only hunger is the hunger for bread. I believe there is a much greater hunger and a much more painful hunger. There is the hunger for love, the feeling of being wanted to be somebody to somebody, the feeling of being unwanted, unloved and rejected is a very great hunger and a very great poverty. When I was photographing this woman named Catherine in Toronto several years ago, she grabbed my dad's hand and with obvious emotion in her voice, she said, 
Thank you so much for doing this. Most people just ignore me. And a few years ago, when I was doing a photo shoot in Hamilton, Ontario, one of the directors of the shelter came up to me and said, days will go by where nobody looks at these individuals. Nobody talks to these individuals, but you look at them, you talk to them, and you are giving them dignity. This is something that we can all do with people experiencing homelessness. When you next see someone experiencing homelessness, look into their eyes, shake their hands, say, hello, how are you doing today? I think you'd be really surprised how much even the smallest gestures are appreciated. Secondly, we can financially support or encourage our parents to financially support organizations that best help people experiencing homelessness. These organizations have the know-how and the resources to best help these people, but are often cash strapped and could really use our financial support. This is why I donate 100% of the profits of my books and also my exhibitions back to homeless shelters. And if you're interested in supporting some of these organizations, I have lists of the organizations I know and trust at the back of my books. And I'll put a link to that in the chat as well. Third, we can pressure our government, both nationally and provincially, which is a bit different there, but, um, on all levels of government to, to, that we need more affordable housing. David Giffen, the executive director of the Coalition of the Homeless says, the vast majority of people experiencing homelessness are simply there because of lack of affordable housing. It is exceedingly rare for someone to choose to be on the street unless they have no other rational options he says, in nearly 30 years of my involvement with people experiencing homelessness, I've yet to meet anyone who would choose to turn their back on an affordable place to live. This is why we must work hard to dispel the myth that people are homeless by choice, when in fact no choice exists. And I want to read to you a saying from one of my heroes, Nelson Mandela. It is in your hands to create a better world for all who live in it. Thank you. I just want to show to you a video. Um, if we have some extra time, do we have some extra time for like a five minute video? Yeah, we've got about um, seven or eight minutes left. Yeah, we've got a maybe time for a video and then a quick question or two. Okay, let's do that. Well. Actually, in that case, would it be better to maybe leave out the video and um, I'll share the wanna, link to my website and we yeah, can just do more if, questions? Let's do that. And why don't you okay. um, make sure to email me the video link and we'll share it with Maureen's class as well. Sure, sounds good. Thank you so much, Leah. That was um, really powerful. Um, students, if you have questions, um, now would be a great time to drop them into the chat or um, the Q&A. Um, but uh, Ms. Connolly, if you, do you have any particular um, like photography related questions that are pertinent to your curriculum right now that you might want to kick us off with? Yes. Uh, first of all, thank you so much. Um, I think not only is your work really beautiful, uh, the, the purpose and reason for why you're making it, I think is extremely profound and important. And we really appreciate you sharing your experiences and your story with us. Um, and this is something, so this class is actually an advanced photography and digital design class. So I have some students that work mostly with photography, some students that are digital drawers, um, but uh, they, the whole goal of this class is for them to start to develop purpose and reason for why they make their work. Um, so you had told us that you've been inspired by your own life experiences and even like the work that you've done with your father. Um, do is this your primary work or do you do other work in addition to this in terms of the type of photography that you do it's a great question uh i wish people asked more often actually because i never get to share <laughs> um so actually by profession i'm a fashion photographer 
which is like mm. complete opposite. Uh, so I do fashion and beauty photography um, sort of to make money um, because with the work I'm doing, this is just documentary work. Um, and because it's non for profit, uh, of course, I can't make any money with it. So I chose a different career path in the field of photography um, that I could make money with. So that is why doing fashion beauty photography. And then I'm doing this as a side project um, while I continue on my career. Uh, I hope to continue photographing people experiencing homelessness in other countries, continuing on my book series um, to raise awareness, raise money for people experiencing homelessness, but it's while I continue um, my career. So I would actually love to, if it's okay, I put there in the link or in the chat, sorry, a link to my, um, my other work if anybody wanted to take a look at that as well mm -hmm. my fashion beauty work stuff too of course and i i did put in the chat there's a link to my humanizing the homeless account um if anybody wanted to take a few books and stuff as well Thank or you. follow that work we have a link to um it's humanizing the homeless on instagram as well if you want to follow along with um with leah's work we'll post it to our fine arts instagram and um it's on our website at the time so I saw another um, Maya, a student popped in a question about um, Leah, how you create your photos so defined and detailed and just curious about your photography process. Um, so interesting that you are also from a fashion background. There's almost, I feel like a portraiture similarity in both, you know, sections of your work, but such different subjects. Mm -hmm. That's a great question, uh, Maya. Um, so I'll sort of explain my process like from the beginning because I didn't really do that yet. So um, I'll go out on the streets um, in often cities is where I'm more likely to find people experiencing homelessness. And my father and I go to locations that people experiencing homelessness likely hang out, which is often places that are more populated or outside of homeless shelters or soup kitchens, safe injection centers, that kind of thing or on, on under bridges is also a really big thing. Um, and then we just go around uh, introducing ourselves to people, explaining the work that we're doing, asking if they would be like, to like to be a part of the project um, and that the profits would be going back to people experiencing homelessness. And about 80% of people are quite excited and say yes. And uh, there's the 20% who don't like our photo taken. And they just usually politely say like, no thanks. And um, then I bring a portable backdrop with me, which is really just a sheet from Walmart. That's like a window sheet. That was like 10 bucks. And um, that's what I've used for like six years. I just need something new. Um, velvet is actually better because it eats up light, but mine is like a crappy reflective piece of material. So I just take the sheet and duct tape and I duct tape it to a wall close by. Um, or if the individual is sitting down, I really like to util utilize like the interesting position they're already in or not disturb the way that they're already sitting. So I'll just like stick it right behind them um, or have someone hold it, worst case scenario. Um, uh, or for the white ones, I have like a white sheet thing or I use that white wall that I had talked about outside of that mall. Um, and when I first started, I was using natural light to light the portraits, but then a couple of years into the project, I started to move to, um, strobe, which was just like a little handheld flash in a gridded softbox. It was like a portable setup, uh, which I used for a couple of years. So that would have been mainly for book two, but then I decided that natural was actually better and that I was getting stronger results with that. So a couple of years ago. I went back to natural light. So with book three and everything you're seeing on Instagram there, that's that's all natural light again. Um, so I've discovered like, I think natural is just the way to go. Uh, you just have more options and more depth. And as long as you're controlling it and and stuff like that. And um, yeah, I think that's sort of an explanation as to my process. Yeah, we've got just about one minute until our students are going to need to um, exit to their next class. Do you have any advice for young photographers that we can go out on? Um, I would just recommend 
following your dream. Um, when I first started, I didn't think I was any good and I wanted to quit, but other people saw the potential in me and that's why I continued. So um, get your work out there and always try. And even if you don't think you're good, like you are and other people will see that. So always follow your dream if that's what you love. So, yeah. That's great advice. Thank you so much. Um, I know the students appreciate it. Um, so thank you. And Maya even thanked you in the chat. So yeah. thank you thank so much. Thank you so much, Leah. I'll thank see you, you in your next class. Thank awesome. you for attending Sounds students. Bye-bye.